It's the Social Oddities Podcast, coming at you from five parts of the UK, all for one reason, the amazing world of wrestling. I've never seen a crowd so fired up, JR. They know what's coming next. They can't wait to get started, and neither can I. Good evening, guys. This is the Social Oddities Podcast. I'm Steve, and I'm here tonight with Adam. We're hello. joined by a guest, Donovan. Donovan Djak. Say hello, Donovan. Hello, what's up? Excellent. We're really pleased that Donovan could spend some time and be on the podcast with ourselves tonight. We've got some great questions that have come in from listeners and ourselves, obviously fans of Donovan's work. We want to hear a little bit more about the man himself. Excellent. Let's do it. Excellent. So just to start off, Donovan, I think a lot of people know about your work with Ring of Honor big part of your development and we just really want to know how it all started for you and you know where you where you're moving forward now uh my uh pro wrestling career started in 2012 at the uh the new england pro wrestling academy it's a school owned by uh brian fury he's the head trainer there okay. um it used to be the chaotic training center and before that it was killer kowalski's uh for those who are familiar with kind of the lineage and history of the world of professional wrestling training. Um, so I started training there in 2012 and I had, uh, my first match in, uh, 2013. So I've, I've really not been, uh, in the, in the grand scheme of things, I haven't been, uh, involved in pro wrestling directly for, for the longest amount of time, but it's, uh, it's certainly been a, a good run for me. Excellent. Well, obviously, you've been involved with one of the largest wrestling companies in the United States. They have media coverage across the world. How did you find dealing with such a large company so early on in your career? Um, I mean, there's different pros and cons uh, from from working with a with a large a large company such as Ring of Honor. I mean, R- Ring of Honor itself isn't isn't the largest company in the world. It's uh, the, it's owned by a, a, a much larger corporation called Sinclair Broadcasting Group, uh, yeah. which when you're dealing with the, the business aspects of, of uh, uh, being a, a, under the corporate umbrella of Sinclair, that can be a little more time consuming and taxing. But, but overall, Ring of Honor is a very intimate and uh, family sort of feeling and atmosphere. So so my time there was was you know, really beneficial to me. And, and, uh, looking back on it, it was, it was a fantastic time for me as well. Great. And um, obviously from doing ring of honor, you kind of hit the ground running, so to speak by winning their top prospect tournament back in 2015. What was that like for you? <clears throat> it was, it was, uh, it was incredible. It was a great opportunity. Um, you know, to, to just be able to be involved in, in something like that was, was really exciting. I mean, it, it was an opportunity that I wasn't sure I would, I would be able to get at, at such an early point in my career. And then ultimately yeah. to be able to, to win it and, and uh, have a, a contract opportunity with a company such as Ring of Honor was, was really the, the, the springboard, so to speak, that, that my career needed at the time. Definitely, definitely. Well, I know Adam was probably going to say we've, you're actually the second person we've had on the podcast who has won the top prospect tournaments. Who's the first? Leo Rush. Oh, Leo Rush, yes, that's right. Yeah, good stuff. So I think I think he actually won the tournament the year after you. Is that right? It was the year after me. He was the first he was the first uh non New Englander to win the top prospect tournament for Ring of Honor because before me was uh Warbeard Hansen, uh before him was Matt Taven, and then the first Top prospect winner was uh, Mike Bennett. Yeah, Mike Mike Bennett. Now, obviously, he's gone to to WWE now. Um, although I'm not, I'm not, not liking the fact that changed his name to my, uh, Mike Canellis. <laughs> that seems a bit. That seems like he's a bit whipped, to be honest. I think I, I believe that's the point. If I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> is it obviously something that you aim to do? Is get to WWE eventually, or? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's uh, a lot of people's goals. Um, for me, of course, it, 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 it'd be nice to to go to WWE, but ultimately, wherever I end up, I, you know, I try to make the most of whatever situation I'm in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a uh, 
uh, a tryout early on with with WWE back in uh, June of 2013. So I mean, uh, you know, obviously I've I've been you know putting in some some leg work uh, in terms of you know marketing myself to to different companies. I was with Ring of Honor under a contract for a while, and now I'm currently a, a free agent. So so uh, so as of right now, I'm just kind of uh, you know. Weighing my options and uh, and uh, you know seeing where the where my cards may end up at the end of the day. Good will we be good stuff? Will, will we be seeing you in uh, England soon? I mean, I noticed you with you doing the Freedom's Road with Progress. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's in like five days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes, you will be seeing me in England very soon. I mean, obviously, to the the the, the fans over in England. This is a question from a friend of mine, Carl. Uh, right. The fans in England who don't know a lot about you, in three words, explain what they should expect from Donovan Dijak. In three words? Wow. I usually get like five or six. No, no. Just, just, we, we, we're very picky in England, so it's just three. Three. Um, I guess the cliche answer would be my catchphrase, which is feast your eyes. <laughs> but, um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to be a little more creative than that. Um, is high-flying one or... One or I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll you, have, you, I'll you have one. That's one word. Okay, so yeah. probably high flying big man. <laughs> right, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that'd be that'd be the best way I could describe myself. Where do you obviously describe yourself as a high flying big man, Donovan? Obviously, from looking at yourself and from looking at how WWE as a company look at wrestlers. You probably would fit in to probably what a lot maybe Vince McMahon's looking for. Would you think that maybe you would really like to wear for them moving forward? I know Adams obviously touched upon that. Yeah, I mean, I I, I like to think that I could uh, bring something unique to to any company in the world. Um, I mean, I, I I've never met Vince McMahon on a personal level. I, I we've like walked by each other a few times at at. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> backstage when I was doing extra work and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, what I, I were you doing backstage? You were a, a security guard? I was a, uh, a rosebud at the, oh, wow. uh, Good. at the Royal Rumble in 2000, um, whatever. It was literally the day after I won the top prospect tournament that we were just talking about. <laughs> yeah. It was that Sunday. I was a rosebud, um, at the Royal Rumble where, uh, I think it, it was the the Royal Rumble where Kofi Kingston uh, did a or got thrown over the top rope onto all the rosebuds, and we we carried him over to the other side of the ring and put him back in the ring. So I was yeah. I, I was part of that that crew that that caught him and stuff. So um, obviously, obviously being a rosebud springs you to, to to bigger things. I mean, you look at Strowman now; he's he's right. <laughs> He was a he was a a, a very large rosebud, yes. <laughs> um, and now he's uh, viciously murdering people and putting them in ambulances. <laughs> so, do you, um, much, do you get much time, Donovan, to obviously watch WWE? Do you, do you get any chances to watch any other promotions other than working on them yourself? I try to watch as much uh, as much wrestling as I can. Um, now, nowadays I don't watch much in terms of, uh, uh, I, I used to religiously watch everything. I, I would, I would absorb everything. Now it's, it's a lot harder, um, between, you know, whatever cable channel things are on and things like that. I don't watch much yeah. of, uh, ROH or, or Lucha Underground or TNA anymore, but I, I do try to keep up with with WWE, mostly because it's it's easier for me to a access and b it's easier for me to uh, to sort of watch. I, I, because for me, if I'm going to study wrestling, then I can I can you know pick and choose what I'm going to study and kind of target what I'm what I'm going to study. But if I'm going yeah. to just try to get like a fan's perspective, which is very important in as a professional wrestler. To, to have the perspective of a fan, um, of, of yourself as a fan, as other fans, um, then to me, watching WWE is the easiest way to do that because I can immediately go on my 
my Twitter feed and, and see what people are, are talking about. I, I watch uh, um, some New Japan as well because people tend to, to discuss New Japan a lot. So, so with, with those two, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's a good source of, of finding out what people like, what people don't like, what I like, what I don't like, you know, and to be able to compare and contrast and, and kind of evaluate, you know, how that fits into what I'm trying to present. Excellent. Well, you know, ourselves, just to give you a bit of a background, we all originally met as part of traveling over to Orlando for WrestleMania weekend, just gone. Um, And we were, you know, all bound together, good friends now. We obviously started the podcast between ourselves. And I think we got a sample whilst we were over there, some of the independent scene, a lot of which is happening over here. There's a massive, massive buzz, which you've seen with progress for the UK wrestling scene. But we are not getting to see some of the stuff from Ring of Honor. We're not getting to see the stuff from New Japan without having to go online. And it, it is a struggle. Totally agree with you. Yeah, there's uh, there's some stuff coming up. Um, I, not that I'm, as, uh, as far as I know, involved in any of it. But but I, I think uh, you, you spoke on Ring of Honor. I know they're doing a tour with, uh, I think it's like... Uh, War of the Worlds, maybe, or so, there's something going on yeah. with uh, Revolution yeah, Wrestling, right. which is a company that that brings me over and uses me a lot. Um, I'm I'm on Rev Pro again, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, uh, wrestling Dave Mastiff in a rematch from an earlier uh, Rev Pro show, so that's exciting. I know Andy uh, from Rev Pro does a lot of work with New Japan, so if you want to see a lot of those guys and those matchups, those are always exciting to to check out so so there's definitely some options if you if you want to see stuff uh, in your backyard i'm sure it's it's probably a, a, a bit of a I'm, I'm guessing those are probably a little bit more of a drive from you for you guys from judging from your accents well i'm based in the liverpool area adam is based uh, near leeds and i know ring of honor are actually having world Wales tour in liverpool so it is something i was interested in going to check out so yeah thank you very much for letting everyone know about that yeah, I think uh, I want to say that the last time that ROH did a an England tour, I, I was on it actually. I want to say one of our stops was in Liverpool. Is that is that the was that the one with the with the big? Uh, I, I mean, if you weren't there, you weren't there. But I, I feel like we did a stop in Liverpool that was either like a basketball gymnasium or it was like a big old uh, sort of opera house looking place. Was it the Liverpool Olympia? Like a boxing that, venue? That sounds familiar, yeah. It, it, it very well may have been. Yeah, well, that's where they're running the show this time around. Oh, cool. it, it is insanely popular. Ring yeah. of Honor, as I say, you know, as a, as a business and as a, kind of a phenomenon, seeing some of the wrestlers that have come out of there, it's something that can't be missed, definitely. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed my time at Ring of Honor, and certainly the, the, the prestige of the company is, is really uh, something to behold. Definitely, definitely. Well, just moving on, obviously, with yourself, I've been checking some things about yourself online, and I was having a look at some of our friends at Cage Match, the internet wrestling database, and I'm going to read out a review which a chap called Matt Stanson wrote about you earlier this month. Oh, I hope it's negative. (laughs) If you happen to know Matt, I think you deserve to buy him a drink after this, by the way. Oh, okay. I I don't think I do, but maybe we... He says, Donovan Dijak is the future of professional wrestling. Wow. He has all of the tools necessary to become one of the greatest workers. Love the gimmick. I believe he's the complete package, a standout professional wrestler, and a definition of one. He is the next generation of test. How does that make you feel? That's well, it's very flattering. I Usually when I'm reading uh, cage match reviews, I, I see the positive ones and I skip right by them and I go straight to the negative ones because those are those are the ones that, that really pique my interest because uh, <laughs> I guess I, ones, I, maybe. I love reading about how horrible I am and uh, what, why, why people think that I'm a terrible professional wrestler. Well, people are always going to hate. That's the problem. <laughs> with professional wrestling. That's but, why we're all fans at okay. the end of the day. Everyone likes something different. I, I mean, it, it does certainly have its its value, though. I mean, it, it, some some people just you know want to want to watch you kind of burn at the stake, but you know there, there's those who provide actual tangible 
you know, feedback and constructive criticism. Because if, it, you know, if I, I have a pretty large fan base and they're, they're, you know, they're usually pretty vocal about enjoying a lot of the stuff I do. And that's great. Um, but those people are already enjoying what I'm doing. So if I can, if I can, you know, kind of hook in some, some new fans that maybe don't necessarily enjoy what I'm presenting right now and maybe adjust something or, or, or tweak something or add something to my repertoire that I'm always looking to, to improve. I mean, a lot of, a lot of guests we ask on is we always say, you know, what is, what are the positives about you? But I'm going to ask you a different one. You mentioned improving them. What do you feel you need to improve on? Oh, there's you, in, in professional wrestling, maybe in everything um, in life, I think there's always room for improvement on in, in every single aspect. I mean, I could sit here and list a hundred different categories of, of things uh, that are required to be an effective professional wrestler. And uh, to, if, I, if I sat here and said that I was perfect at any single one of them, I would be lying to both myself and to everybody else. Not only that, but it's not only me, but it's, it's everybody. You know, you take the greatest professional wrestler in the world, and even they can improve on, you know, every single aspect of, of professional wrestling. You know, there's some things that, are, that I'm better at than, and, than others, and, and that's okay. Maybe I can focus on, on some of the things that need a little bit more improvement. But, but overall, I think everyone's goal, not just in professional wrestling, but in anything that you want to succeed in in life, uh, should be to improve as much in every aspect as, as you possibly can at all times. That's a, that's a very good answer, yeah. Yeah, well, one of the, the things as well, Donovan, we, one of our friends who I mentioned earlier that we, we met over in Orlando had a very specific question for you. So it's a shout out to a lady by the name of Saturn who lives in Miami. She wanted to know what it was like for you wrestling Keith Lee. Uh, wrestling Keith, I, I assume she's referring to my match at Evolve 81. Possibly, uh, possibly. I'm from Orlando, Florida that weekend. Um I mean that that match specifically was was a, a a real needle mover for for myself and for for Keith Lee. It was our uh, either our fourth or fifth matchup at the time. Uh, I think now we're on number eight. I just wrestled him last weekend again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's it you know it's kind of the match that keeps on giving. You know me and me and Keith are are really good friends. Uh, you find we, that chemistry on, works well when you wrestle more often, obviously. Yeah, I mean it's it's we we just clicked from day one. The first time it was booked in in Beyond Wrestling, um, which is one of my home promotions, one of my favorite promotions. Uh, you know, I was super excited about the match, and uh, and it seemed like everything just meshed you know totally together for for two guys who have such a, a similar sort of style. It was yeah. it, it, we were able to just highlight the 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 strengths of each other. Um, so to speak, uh, very effectively, and uh, it's just it's just taken off from there. And it, it seems like every time we get together, we come up with new and creative ways to kind of destroy each other. So so everyone's really enjoying it. The the matchups seem to be getting better and better, and uh, and you know hopefully hopefully we can just keep getting more and more eyes on on the matchup because it's it's always fun for us, and I know it's always fun for the fans too. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was happened to be chatting online with I think the promoter from Beyond Wrestling earlier this week, and I mentioned that you were on the show. And obviously, we were talking about some bits and bobs to do with your up-and-coming shows that are coming up there. Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to? Anyone lined up that's been announced already? There's a ton of great matchups that have been announced for me. I mean, I've got um, this this week uh, coming up alone on, um, on Friday. I'm, I have a singles match against uh, one of my best friends, not only in, in professional wrestling, but in life in general, Anthony Green. Who's a real? He's from my my school, and he's a a real up and coming talent who I think is going to open a lot of eyes in the next few years. Uh, that's for Limitless Wrestling in Maine. Then on Saturday, I'm in. Uh, I have Beyond Wrestling, as as you just mentioned. Um, it's a tag team match again. I tag team with one of, one of, another one of my best friends, Mikey Webb, and we're going to be taking on. Um, what is their tag team name? It's <laughs> It's Chuck Taylor and it's uh, Orange Cassidy. I can't remember what the hell they call their name though. Um, 
Anyway, whatever their tag name is, that's that's who we're wrestling for for Beyond, and that one's going to be on Flow Slam. So so anybody in the world can watch that one <clears throat> this Saturday. Then I uh, I start to make my way over to England. I'm I'm in England throughout the week. I'm not sure which matchups I have until Friday. I have a big rematch against Eddie Dennis, which is always exciting. He and I had a killer match at uh, the Cockpit and Rev Pro uh, a few weeks back. Saturday I've got the huge. Uh, figuratively and literally huge match um, against uh, British Strong Style and OTT, uh, which is going to be them against uh, myself, Keith Lee, and Sammy Callahan. So I think a lot of people were looking forward to that big matchup. And then Sunday, yeah, definitely yeah, and, then, and then Sunday I have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, against uh, Dave Mastiff uh, for Rev Pro. So that's, that's kind of what I have coming up in the near future. And there, there's a bunch of uh, matches mixed in there that haven't been announced yet, so I'm, I'm excited about all those as well. You mentioned, you mentioned obviously, the, 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 the British guys you're facing, but, I mean, who, who is the best British guy you've uh, faced so far? The best British guy that I've faced? I don't, I don't know who the, the best, per se, would be, but I've certainly had a number of, uh, of really... Uh, sort of renowned matches against Josh Bodum. He was he was one of the he, one of the guys I wrestled for Rev Pro on my first tour. And uh, the people were really excited about that matchup so much that I, I was brought back maybe a month later for a rematch. And then we finally had the the uh, the, the, the trifecta match uh, a few months back for Rev Pro. And it, it, those, those are more matches that just felt like they kept getting better and better every, every time we wrestled. So so he's a guy that I, I obviously really enjoy wrestling, but I, you know I've wrestled so many, so many uh, uh, British talent, and, and everybody's amazing, and the crowd's always amazing. So so I always look forward to coming back. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, as Adam, you know, we, and we were touching on earlier, the scene in the UK has absolutely exploded. It's something that I think everyone's really excited with at the moment. Do you feel that, as has kind of happened with a lot of smaller US promotions, that we could be reaching maybe a bit of a saturation point? Or yeah. is all, all wrestling good, obviously, at the end of the day? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Um, we were actually just discussing this. I had a show last night in Tennessee, and it, myself and uh, Ethan Page were on it. And, um, and he's another good friend of mine. And we, we, uh, we shared a hotel room together, and we were talking about how how you know we feel like it's it's such a, a, a fortuitous, if that's a word, uh, sort of boom period right now, especially on the independent level for professional wrestling. That there's no way that it's sustainable at this level. Um, we we hope it is. Um, it, wrestling seems to go in peaks and valleys, and right now seems like a real peak, especially for for independent pro wrestling. So. I mean, I, I hope it stays at this level. I really do. I, I, I'm I'm sure that a lot of it has to do with the the advent of uh, you know streaming networks on online and the, the the access that people now have to all these different platforms of professional wrestling. So so hopefully it does sort of stay at this level because it's 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 great to see so many guys in professional wrestling being able to. To, to make a living off professional wrestling, to, to be able to move up to different companies, to be able to get seen by, by different people, different promoters, when even four or five years ago, it wasn't really a, a viable option. So, so I really, really hope it, it, it stays at the level it is now because it, it doesn't matter where you are. You know, the, in England, in the United States, in Japan, and all, all over the world, it, it just seems that right now that professional wrestling is, is, is really a hot ticket item and, and that's so exciting to see. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, with things like Impact Wrestling, say, for example, teaming up with um, companies in Japan, teaming up with companies in Mexico, do you think we might see some sort of reemergence of an NWA type function where some of the smaller promoters could band together, have top stars, share them throughout? Or do you think we're past that now because of the digital age? Uh, I think there's a bit of that happening right now. Um, you see a lot of like cooperation between some promotions. And granted, sometimes it you know it's short-lived, sometimes it's a little longer. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, communication is a, is a, is a, big, uh, a big factor in a lot of that. Um, I think the reason that 
you know, companies like, uh, like RevPro and, and Progress and, uh, and like an Evolve, a Beyond Wrestling, you know, the, the reason that those companies have been able to work with, with so many other companies successfully is because they're, they're open to, to communicate with those other companies. Um, and th that's just the short list of guys that I've, you know, uh, had the opportunity to, to, to work with. So, and there's, there's much more than that out there. So, so I, I think the, as long as the lines of communication are open, then, then there's always the, the, the opportunity for it in terms of, uh, like something like the NWA, like one all seeing sort of governing body. I think that's probably less realistic, um, Mo mostly because there's so much success to be had uh, as independent companies that I, I, I picture it hard to say that, you know, everybody would sort of trust like one uh, entity to sort of oversee all of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'd never say never, but that, that seems sort of unrealistic in today's day and age. Um, but, but you, you never know what might work and what might not work. So, so it's, it's certainly, uh, I mean, I, I guess it's a possibility, but I mean, anything's a possibility really. Yeah, definitely. Well, there was one question that I know Adam was burning to ask you. It may be a little bit of a sore subject. So just to warn you now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I like to think I have pretty thick skin. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, it's a, again, it's a message, uh, a question from my friend, Carl. Um, it was basically, what's your side of the uh, Cody Rhodes chair shot situation? The chair shot situation? Yeah. <laughs> a, a lot, a, apparently a lot of people have said it was the worst chair shot they've seen in years. Yeah. And, uh, and do, do you regret taking it? Do I regret taking it? No, I don't. Um, I, th I think sort of the shelf life on that has, has sort of passed, I think. For, for a while there, Cody and I, um, who, by the way, he and I are, are, are good friends. Uh, the, the, um, so for a while, even like that night and the, the following months, it was getting so much buzz and, and publicity out of it that, uh, that we sort of like put it on the, on the shelf in terms of talking about it because we wanted, you know, to, to leave the people kind of in the dark. Um, but I think, I think that time's pretty much passed. So, I mean, I can, I can be a little more upfront about it now, especially since I don't want people having this sort of, uh, uh, underlying sentiment about, about me or Cody or, or anything like that. So, so basically, uh, what happened that night is, um, is Cody and I were set to wrestle. It was our first match. We've wrestled three times now, but that was the first time it was in San Antonio for ring of honor. And uh, we were the the match right before the main event. The main event, I think, was the Young Bucks and maybe some other guys in the Bullet Club and some some sort of multi man match. <clears throat> but it, it involved the Bullet Club, and, and Cody at the time was in the Bullet Club. Uh, so so Cody um, was was uh, set to defeat me, and then we needed a, a, a transition to get to the main event, and it it, it we we. The, the, the decision was made that it would be weird uh, for me to just leave and for Cody to stay in the ring and introduce the Bullet Club. So we, the, we were asked to, to, to do something to, to take me out after the match. Um, Cody pitched something, you know, relatively safe, like clipping my leg or something like that. And, and I was like, no, that's kind of boring. Why don't you sit me down in a chair and blast me with, a, with another chair? <laughs> so... <laughs> For the record, 100% my idea. The the chairs in San Antonio are made of plastic, um, so they're not real steel chairs or anything. They're those plastic folding chairs that still make a really loud noise when it connects. Um, I, I, I believe the direct quote from me to Cody was, uh, swing for the fences like Barry Bonds, um, which he did. Uh, he sat me down in the chair. Um, the, the, the video that everybody saw was a, was a fan, a fan camera that happened to be the same angle as hard camera. So we worked it out that way where you can't really see my full, uh, forearm go up at the, at the last second, which it does. The, the chair itself didn't touch my head whatsoever. Um, it literally hit my, uh, 
Uh, mostly my hand, actually. My hand was a little sore, but nothing was broken or anything like that. The, but the chair itself, um, it made it, it made no impact. It didn't touch my head whatsoever. I, I just threw myself back, as I always do whenever I'm taking anything, really, to make it look like it destroyed me. Um, the, 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 the gentleman who was filming it uh, <laughs> had a very loud and, uh, and curse-filled reaction to what he was seeing, so I think that made it seem like it was a lot worse than it was. <laughs> all in all, it just kind of uh, swirled into the perfect storm of looking like I got viciously murdered when, when in reality it was uh, 100% my idea. Um, he was just kind of following along, and it was, it was done completely safely, and, and uh, I'm... I'm I'm right at the forefront of uh, of uh, you know concussion prevention and concussion issues. I I, um, I I've worked with the Concussion Legacy Foundation, which is headed by Chris Nowinski. He's uh, he's from my area. I live in in Massachusetts. He's from the Boston area. He actually trained as a professional wrestler at the Chaotic Training Center in Killer Kowalski's, uh, which was the early stages of the school that I'm at now. So so he and I have have talked before. I'm a, a card carrying member of uh, the, the 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 brain uh, donation. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, what it's called, but my, my brain after after I uh, pass away will be donated to to the Concussion Legacy Foundation to be studied. So so I'm a, I'm a big supporter of all that stuff. And and the the the, the to, to circle back around the the chair shot uh, spot itself was done um, in a very safe manner where I. I was not injured or or hurt whatsoever that's 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 good to know and uh i'm hope people can uh, listen to that and obviously be happy with what you said there yeah i mean i mean there was about seven thousand tweets sent out saying about how dangerous and stupid we were so i'd i'd <laughs> i'd like for those people to maybe maybe listen in and, and understand that you know may, maybe every once in a while the professional wrestlers who, who dedicate their lives to doing something sort of have a, a grasp on on what's going on we're just not we're not just in there recklessly killing ourselves uh you know for the sake of making a name for ourselves yeah i mean I mean, you, you say about one chair shot, but then obviously you had the uh, what was it? Is it a tournament of death last week or the week before with the CCW? <laughs> I mean, that's just nuts. Yeah, I watched I watched some stuff from from tournament of death. Uh, not not because I particularly enjoy death matches. I don't. Um, but I, I I I like to sort of broaden my horizons. I, I heard people talking about it. Um, I I. I wouldn't say I'm friends, but I, I know Jimmy Havoc. We've met a couple times. He's been a really nice guy. So I wanted to see, um, you know, what was going on. He, I, I've, uh, I've wrestled Ricky Shane Page before, so I, I wanted to see what was going on with him. Uh, Connor Claxton's another guy I really, I really like being around. So, so I watched the finals of that and and uh, won one or two of the earlier matches, and and it was it was it was interesting stuff. It was unique. Um, it's not it's not my particular cup of tea. But I, I, I thought I owed it to those guys to, you know, watch some of the stuff that was getting some buzz on, on the Internet. So and, and um, yeah, so I was able to, to watch a few matches of those. And, and um, you know, some some of the stuff was 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 kind of captivating to watch. How, how much money would it take for you to do a tournament of death? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. It's, I mean, it's not it's it's just personal preference. I mean, I, I, it's not. It's not something I would do. I mean, maybe if you're going to donate a bunch of money to charity, I'd think about it. But, but I mean, it's just not something I'm interested in doing. Like if a, if a promoter hit me up, I I wouldn't bother giving him a fee because I, I wouldn't want to insult anybody like that. You know, I, it's it's not it's not something I'm interested in doing. It's not something I'm you know. If, of course, if some millionaire said he, his dream was to see me in a death match, he said he'd donate a million dollars to, to cancer research if I did. You know, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd do it. But I, I'm not really if, if, if a promoter asked me, I, I'd say that I'm, I'm not interested. OK, well, one of the interesting things, Donovan, that came out of Tournament of Death, I think. And again, also that's come out of fairly recently with Marty School would be wrestlers selling things on eBay. One of the things I noticed that popped up earlier this week was Jimmy Havoc's match-worn top, which was covered in blood. Would you ever buy any of your stuff on eBay like that to earn a couple of bucks? eBay, no. Um, 
I mean, yeah, I would. I, I, I prefer not to use eBay because I, I have an eBay store and it's actually fairly difficult to maintain. And, uh, and, uh, I, I find it's a lot easier to just post things on, on social media. I, I tend to get a pretty yeah. quick response and, and it's a lot easier to just message the person back and forth and, and get an address and I send them my PayPal and that's it. So yeah, I, I, I love selling, uh, my old stuff. It's, it's a win win. You know, there's a lot of fans out there who like collecting ring worn merchandise and things like that. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with it. If I'm, if I'm done with my gear, I'm done with my gear. You know, I might keep a thing here or there for sentimental purposes, but I'd rather it go to, you know, a collector or a fan or, or whatever it has, has to be. And, and yeah, so I'm always happy to do transactions like that, but I usually do them on, on Facebook or Twitter as opposed to eBay. eBay is just a ton of work. One of the things that was um, fairly interesting was Marty's umbrella from his bullet club unveiling. I oh, think did it was up to a thousand pounds last night or something like that. It was crazy. Yeah, I heard he broke it. Ah, right. So there's a there's a warning to anyone who might be looking out at that on eBay at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Marty won't thank you for that one. Right. Well, he's beat me a bunch of times and broken my fingers and made me tap out to his chicken wings. So. Adios. <laughs> <laughs> Well, earlier today as well, I was obviously having a little look at some things about yourself, and one of the things that popped up was an interview that you did earlier this year with ESPN, where you talk about your career and you go into some detail about obviously how you started, what you're looking to do in the future. How did something like that come about? Because ESPN, being a massive carrier across the world, obviously put you out there on their publications. Um, the the gentleman who wrote that article, I believe his name is Tim, uh, he... I, I assume he's from the Connecticut area because ESPN's based out of Connecticut. Okay. Uh, the, there's a there's a branch of ESPN now called WWE or ESPN WWE or WWE on ESPN, something like that. But it covers a, a, a bunch of different platforms of wrestling. So he had done articles, either him or, or someone who else who works for the. I'm not sure the the lineage of all of it, but had had covered. Um, uh, I think it was All Star Extravaganza in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, where I wrestled uh, Bobby Fish for the television title on pay per view um, late last year. So he had covered, or somebody in that branch had had covered that that uh, before. And then uh, Northeast Rest Northeast Wrestling is a a company that's based out of Connecticut that I work for, and I've worked for for a long time. And uh, Tim was there. To, to, I don't know if he was seeking interviews or what exactly he was looking for, but ultimately he ended up doing an article on Keith Lee. And uh, Keith mentioned that, that, you know, he should, you know, think about doing an article on me as well. Um, so, so he did. And, and that's how the article came to fruition. I think, I think it was done in uh, March, February or March of, of this year. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was it was a well well written article and everything like that. So I, I was just happy to be a part of it. You know, the, 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 to be able to see your name on on a you know a branch of, of ESPN.com is is you know always a, a cool feeling. So so you know that was that was it was good. It, it, you know, it got a lot of a lot of eyes on on me and a lot of eyes on you know some different companies that I work for. So that's that's always a win win I think for everybody involved. Definitely, definitely. Well, talking about some of the other companies that you've worked for, obviously you've worked since leaving Ring of Honor quite extensively over the last couple of years. One of the things that I noticed you were involved in the 16 karat gold tournament for WXW over in Germany. How was that? Because that is something that a lot of European fans will be aware of. We're all big fans of Super Strong Style, which is a very similar tournament that Progress Wrestling put out there. What was it like wrestling in uh, 16 karat gold? It was awesome. Uh, 16 karat gold was, uh, well, WXW was actually the company that first brought me over for a, uh, for my first European tour early last year. So, so they're, they're, they're a company that I've, I've always, uh, looked up to, I've, I've always thought very highly of, and, and they, you know, obviously have been a, a, a big platform for me and a big supporter of me. So um, when I when I finally left 
uh, Ring of Honor, which was in February of this year. Um, my I had some dates that I had been holding for Ring of Honor that I I wasn't going to be a part of anymore, and one of yeah. them need, one of them was the 16 karat gold weekend, which was always something that I wanted to be a part of. So I so I messaged WXW and they happened to have uh, an opening. Um, I can't remember exactly what happened. I think there was maybe an injury or something, but they happened to have an opening in the in the tournament. So so we were able to to work it out where I was able to to go over and be part of the tournament and um, and it you know it was spectacular for me. I I I, uh, I was able to to face Matt Riddle uh, in one of our our few singles matches that we had, and it was it was you know awesome as always. And then I had Jeff Cobb the first time uh on day two and then on day three it was it was a, a really fun uh tag match uh, myself and, and jt dunn against ach and and uh speedball mike bailey um and me and jt decided to use cody rhodes as our uh as our manager so so it was really 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 a lot of fun for us um and uh it, it was a it was a it was, it was a great time as as it usually is Good stuff. Well, we're talking a bit earlier about WXW and the fact that Progress do a similar tournament. They are having um, some sort of super show, which is coming up over in Cologne, which is at the beginning of July, I believe. Would you like to be involved with anything to do with Super Strong Star maybe next year, with them obviously having so close links? Yeah, I mean, anything's a possibility. I um, There was... Uh... Any any tournament that that you can be a part of is is always exciting. You know that I, I've 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 been um, I've been lucky to be involved in in sixteen karat gold and Beyond Wrestling runs a, a a tournament for tomorrow, which which was which was exciting. I mean, tournament for tomorrow was tough because it was wrestling multiple matches um, in one day. And the, the final match was, was against Matt Riddle. So that was, that was a real, uh, sort of strenuous rough day for my body. I remember waking up the next morning and being in probably the most sore I've been since I stopped playing, um, American football. But, uh, but yeah, any, any tournament that I can be part of, uh, especially the, you know, the highly touted and prestigious ones. I mean, I, I, I'm always all for it. You know, the, the more, the more matches, the the merrier, because that's just more opportunities to to you know uh, to make a name for myself, which is which is ultimately what 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 the goal is when you're trying to to build a brand for yourself. Yeah, I was lucky enough to meet Matt over in Orlando. He was wrestling for Progress over there. Genuinely lovely guy, really is. And I think the way he wrestles and the way he is are two entirely polar opposites. It's unbelievable, really. <laughs> yes, he's he's uh, he's he's a very genuinely nice guy until he's choking you to death, and then <laughs> and then you you don't think quite so fondly of him. No, I can understand that. I can understand <laughs> that. Well, obviously, we talk quite a lot about the different promotions that you've been with. You've spoken about working in America, working over here in the UK, and then obviously there in Germany. What is next for Donovan Dijak? What will be your next projects? What are you looking to do? Are you looking to go into maybe into doing things in Mexico? Are you looking to go into Japan? Or are you going to solely focus on Europe and America? Um, well, my dogs seem upset about something. Might be our they, questions. Yeah, they don't, they don't like the, the, the concept of me leaving that much. Um, if there's yeah. an intruder in the house, he's really picked the wrong house and the wrong dude to mess with. Yes, I'm. I'm always looking to expand. Um, I've I've been since day one. I've been contacting promoters in in Mexico, Japan, uh, Australia, Hungary, and literally every country um, in the world, trying to 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 find a way to 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 branch out to see if we can work something out. Sometimes it works out, like you know Germany and Ireland and England, and sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't work out in, in other cases, but I, I'm, I'm never going to stop trying. Um, in terms of my immediate future, I've, I've got so many promising things on the, on the horizon in the, in the very near future that, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for, for what I have coming up over, over the next few months. So, so I, that's that's what I'm focusing on now. Hopefully that'll lead to you know traveling to, to different countries and, and things like that. But 
but ultimately, I, I think everyone is is going to be very pleasantly surprised with with some of the the the, the things that that we have in store. Now that that's really impressive. Let's just say there's a promoter out there at the moment. How does he go about getting in contact with you? That's fairly easy. Uh, the same way most people get in contact with me, which is through any form of direct messaging that you can find. I'm I'm pretty easy to locate on most. Uh, most platforms of social media, uh, all, all of it is Donovan Dijak, which is D-O-N-O-V-A-N-D-I-J-A-K. Uh, you can direct message me on Twitter. You can, um, you can message me on Facebook. Uh, th- those are the easiest ways because literally anybody in the world can do it. So, so that, that those would be the, the easiest ways. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I've got, you know, pretty much every, every platform of every relevant platform of, of social media and all of my, I check most of my messages pretty regularly. So it's not, it is not difficult to get in touch with me. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, over to Adam. Adam, do you have anything for Donovan? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously we've talked about your wrestling and when you started, but um, by all accounts, you were, you were quite the decent footballer. Is that right? What kind of football are we talking about? Uh, the 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 the, uh, the type that I really don't understand. The uh, American football. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's honest. I, I was I was back in the day. I, I haven't played a, a down of football in about uh, eight years now. So I'd, I'd, I'm pretty sure that if I went out on the football field, I'd I'd probably fall over and and pass away. But uh, but yeah, back um, back in my high school and college days, I was. I was a pretty well recruited uh, football player. I had some Division One scholarship offers. Ultimately, I ended up at uh, the University of Massachusetts, uh, and after one year, I transferred to a, a smaller school so I could so I could play both football and basketball. Is it, was it a, was it a, a career that you could have potentially gone into, or was wrestling always the the thing that you wanted to do? Um, for a little bit, throughout most of my high school, I was, uh, I was sort of convinced that, that I would, uh, attempt to make a run at playing in the, the NFL. Um, when I got to college, that only seemed like a realistic avenue if I were willing to pursue being an offensive lineman. And I don't know how much you guys know about American football, but an offensive lineman is basically the the gigantic uh, sort of 350 pound dudes who who do the blocking up front. Um, so it's it's very painful. There's a lot of injuries. There's really not much uh, uh, glory involved in it. It's, it's just quite painful, and there's not really much of a of a of a payoff other than the you know the the, the check that you get in the in the mail every week. Um, it was a, a good buddy of mine, Moose. He was an NFL offensive lineman for for seven years, I think. So, you know, he obviously was able to to make a career out of it. I, I, and he and I talk, and I, I don't think he was in love with being an offensive lineman. And either I, most most guys really aren't because it's not the the most fun position in the world. But I gave it a shot for a year when I was in college. I didn't really like it, and I transferred to a smaller school because. Even even if that was what I happened to be the best at, it wasn't something that I wanted to to do as a career. Because if I'm going to do something as a career, I want to I want to enjoy it. I want to like going to work. It doesn't really matter to me how much um, how much money I'm making if I don't enjoy what I'm doing. You know? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I I didn't enjoy getting hit by 350 pound uh, men either. No, it's it's not. It's not fun. It's quite painful. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, once you decided then to to become a wrestler, who were your inspirations growing up, like the wrestling side? You know, I wouldn't say that I had any real inspirations. Because uh, the, the word inspire, I mean, that, that's sort of, I sort of reserve that for like family members, like my dad, my brother, my mom, you know, things like that. I, in terms of guys that I enjoyed watching as a kid, I, I really liked Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, guys, I, I like to to go back and watch to to take bits and pieces from, um, or to study would be guys like uh, The Rock or Randy Orton. Um, JBL is another one. Uh, I like going back and watching stuff from Mike Awesome. Um, 
pretty much any any bigger guy who can who can move uh, fluidly around in the ring is is something that I really enjoy watching and taking stuff from the Undertaker, Brock Lesnar. Those those are all guys. Triple H. They're all they're all guys that that I really uh, enjoy watching and and you know um, not necessarily modeling myself after, but but just you know finding little nuances and things like that, things that I can tweak. Things that I can adjust to my to my performance, stuff like that. That's that's great. I mean, um, obviously, like you say, obviously you mentioned your family. So I'm assuming your family quite important to you um, more than 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 wrestling, I suppose. My family. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, I've uh, my 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 nuclear family is just my mom, my dad, and my my brother, and they're all you know incredibly important to me. And now. Now I'm married to my wife, and and she's uh, she's six months pregnant. So so those those things are obviously on the on the forefront of my mind, and in, in literally everything I do, um, you know, professional wrestling is is what takes up most of my time. But I'm I'm thinking about them, and my I have two mini schnauzers too. They're who you heard earlier, but they're calmed down now, and and one of them's laying next to me, and I'm petting him right now. So the, those are those are the uh, the, the 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 physical uh, loves of my life, as opposed to wrestling, which I suppose takes up a lot of the mental uh, love in my life. <laughs> so you you, may, you mentioned your dogs. What, what do you call the dogs? What are their names? Yeah, uh, I have a little white mini schnauzer called Brody, and uh, a slightly larger mini schnauzer, and his name is Oliver. Cool names. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, when you're away, probably four, maybe five times a week, what do you like to do when you get home to, you know, relax, wind down? <laughs> if I have time to, um, I mean, I, I really like playing with my dogs, um, just spending time with my wife, watching, you know, watching television, or we like to go out to the movies every so often. Um, if if it's time at night and I'm by myself, I'll, I'll turn on the, the WWE network and watch some, some old school wrestling. Not maybe I'm not a, a huge fan of like old, old stuff. I'll, I'll watch it just to, to learn. But as a, as a fan, when I'm watching, I like to go back and watch stuff from like the early to mid two thousands. Um, sometimes the late two thousands. That's, that's the stuff that I, that I really enjoy, you know, like the, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, um, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, those, those sort of matches are what really piqued my interest. Yeah, I think probably Eddie, especially Eddie, was uh, was a phenomenal wrestler. Um, I think he got a bit underutilized in WCW, but then he really, really took off in WWE. Yeah, every every wrestler has their as their peaks and valleys, you know, some, some guys get used properly one way and, 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 uh, you know, they have their, their push in one company, but in another company it didn't really fit. So, so it all depends on timing where you are and, and how things work out. And luckily, luckily we all got to see what I would assume a lot of people consider to be the, 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 the best, um, stuff from, from Eddie Guerrero. Um, and obviously anytime he got in the ring, it was, it was a spectacular performance. Who, who, which wrestler from, from yesteryear, so to speak, would you love to have got in the ring with, uh, dead or alive, you know? That doesn't wrestle anymore? Um, yeah, that doesn't wrestle anymore, yeah. Probably The Undertaker. And what, what was your reasoning behind that? What's... He's just such a talented, you know, big man. I mean, it. The, uh, the the things that he was capable of doing at a at a much larger size than me for a for a sustained period of time is is just overwhelming and and the amount of high quality caliber matches that he put on is is really breathtaking and the the, the performance the the showmanship the the character everything about him is 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 just spectacular to me. That's great. Have you ever did you ever get a chance to meet him or? Um. We walked by each other a couple times. <laughs> I don't, I don't think he, we shook hands or anything. But you, that's not really what you do when you're an extra at TV. You know, you just kind of float around. But he, he was at one of the one of the TVs I was at. I, I was at the uh, 
God, I don't know if you guys will remember this, but I do because I was there. Um, the uh, it was a Monday Night Raw building up to the uh, the match at WrestleMania between CM Punk and The Undertaker, and there was a Raw where uh, where CM Punk had like stolen The Undertaker's urn or something. Is that uh, just? Is it just after Paul Bearer had died? Correct. So Paul Bear had just passed away and um, and CM Punk like stole the urn and there something at this episode happened where like Paul Heyman like was like running up the ramp and like fell or something and he like dropped the urn or something like that. I don't remember exactly what happened, but it was something to that effect and I, I was I was there as an extra. We we didn't end up doing anything that particular night. Um so I was. I, you can't like find me on the episode or anything, but I, I was floating around backstage that night. Uh, wicked, wicked. I mean, you always see these clips of uh, future wrestlers in their extra days. You see it be like Sheamus, and I think was it uh, Champa was there as well. And yeah, well, uh, Tommaso's was a lot easier because he was uh, a lawyer who got choke slammed by the Undertaker in the middle of the ring. <laughs> yeah. um, so his is a lot easier to find. Mine are mine are more like Easter eggs. The the rosebud one is probably really easy to find because um, it's it's such a easy moment. You can go right on the network and find it. And and I'm I'm kind of in the back, but I'm you know I'm tall, so you can kind of see me. I have like a green wig on and like a like a poncho or something like that. And my buddy my buddy who I'm wrestling on Friday, Anthony Green, he's he's there with me as well. We both have green wigs on. Um, the, there's a there's one that's much earlier, it was my first appearance. Um, it's actually a funny story. My first, my first match, my first like organized match ever in professional wrestling took place in a WWE ring because they they used to do matches for the extras before the the tapings at SmackDown. So it was a it was a tag team match, and I'd never been in like an organized match really. I mean, I'd sort of like done one in class before, but never really like with a referee or anything like that um, until this this uh, this taping, which was in Hershey, Pennsylvania. It was SmackDown in uh, February of 2013. So I'd only been training for about you know three or four months, something like that at the time, and. Um, but I, they ended up using us as an extra at the end of the episode. It was it was like a multi-man tag, uh, like an eight-man tag, something like that. I think Randy Orton was in it. I think Sheamus was in it. Uh, the, the Shield was in it. I remember because we walked to the ring uh, through the through the backstage to we didn't we didn't go to the ring, but we got. We had to walk with the Shield through their backstage to get to their weird entrance to the crowd thing that they used to do. Um, and we as extras stayed up in this like this like uh, like box seat sort of area where there was uh, there was a bunch of people with like I guess standing room tickets or something like that. So they cleared out an area of 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 that uh, because at the end of the match all these guys were going to brawl up through the crowd, um, and and ultimately that's what they did. They brawled up up near us and they they hit our nachos and our drinks and stuff and we overreacted and you can, if you if you kind of freeze frame it you can see a, a, a young Donovan Dijak I think before I had the name Donovan Dijak so it's so a young Chris Dijak uh, just kind of floating around in, in, in the crowd uh, in that general area as those guys uh, smashed each other with food so so if anybody wants to go back and search that, I know it is on the network because I looked it up one time. At, at one point, it was like the only, it was like the earliest SmackDown that they had because the network, I think, was created like maybe like a week later or something like that. Uh, I don't remember the exact timing of it, but but I know it's on the network somewhere if anybody wants to, to look it up and, and screenshot it to me. I think that'd be funny. No, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Donovan for coming on, really, and giving us an hour of his time. It's really good to see wrestlers devoting things um, to the fans, people who want to hear their story. And I think you've really given us an insight on what it's like to be a pro wrestler. Yeah, awesome. I had a fun time. Thank you for having me. No problem. Well, just as a, a closing thought, I think one of the things that we, we like asking people who come on regularly would be 
do you have any hints and tips for anyone who might be looking to come into the industry? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? My dog was chewing on a squeaky toy. <laughs> I'll let you off. We have the same problems. I was just asking as a closing thought for the podcast, maybe you could just advise some of the listeners what might be, you know, the route into the industry and some hints and tips. Uh, towards breaking into pro wrestling? Yeah. Uh, the first thing that I tell anyone is to find a good school. Um, preferably a great school. Uh, there, there's a bunch all over the world. Um, if you're, I assume most of the people who, who listen to this are in the UK. So, uh, if I were going to recommend a school in the UK, it would be, um, there's a few at, at the top of the list would be Johnny Moss's, uh, uh, I think he calls the school like hammer locks and headlocks or something like that. You, you can just look it up on, on Google. It's Johnny Moss. It's in, uh, uh, Cumbria, Egremont, I believe is the town. It's a real small town in the middle of nowhere, but I, I trekked up there by train. It was like a five hour thing to train with him for a week. And he's, he's world renowned. He used to be a trainer at UK Hammerlock, which is one of the top schools in the world. And, and now he's, he's got his own school. So that's, to me, that's one of the top schools in the world, but there's a few others in that area. The, the, especially if you're down closer to like the London area rev, uh, Revolution Pro has a school uh, with Andy Simmons, and uh, Progress has the Pro Joe, which is which is run by a, a, a slew of wonderful trainers. So, um, you know, you have a, a ton of options. Um, to me, in, in North America, there's a, a few premier schools um, between uh, the, the the Dudley School. Um, my school that I go to, the New England Pro Wrestling Academy, the Monster Factory, um, uh, OVW, uh, and uh, Lance Storm is, is, is a school that I hold in very, very high regard. Um, obviously, if anybody can make their way to the New Japan Dojo, that's that's a wonderful place to, to train. But um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of schools uh, all over the world. Um, depending on your area there's there's usually at least something within within a few a few uh you know a few hours drive if you will if you're in the midwest and harley races school is a great option if you're the the uh the if you're in california then there's santino brothers or um or brian kendrick school so, so you see so you've got a, you've got a ton of options but uh but you always want to make sure that you find a you know a really good school or make a a, a trip to to train for you know a few weeks or months at a at a at a great prestigious school, because um, because that's where you get your foundation. Your foundation never really changes over the course of time, um, so you want to make sure that the that the first early months are are done properly because it's it's very very important in terms of. Of building a foundation and also building a, a network uh, because networking and pro wrestling is of the utmost importance. That's great. Well, thanks very much. I'm sure you've probably inspired at least one listener who might go out there and have a little look at some of those schools either in the UK or further afield. That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much, Donovan, and thanks very much for all your time. Yes, yeah, no been problem. great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to the Social Oddities podcast with this week's guest, Donovan Dijak. Don't forget to check out The Social Oddities on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. T-shirts are now available to all our podcast fans. They're available in a variety of different colors and also in different sizes. Keep in contact, follow, like, and share. Let all your friends know to listen to The Social Oddities podcast.